And hello from uh, Keep Racquetball Great Facebook page. My name is Marty Hogan, and I am in charge of doing this interview tonight that uh, that I'm very much uh, excited about, looking forward to, because there's going to be some information that's going to come out tonight to enlighten people as to what it took to put on the biggest racquetball event, I think of this year and maybe of uh, of maybe the next year or in the future to come and stuff with the three wall ball championships. Joining me tonight is Mike Coulter. For a lot of you uh, out there, because he's not was not a professional racquetball player, a lot of you don't know uh, Mike's history in the sport, but Mike is one of the few. And when I say one of the few, I say one of the few lifers in the game of racquetball, who out of the love of the sport, number one, uh, number two, out of his friendship with past pro Brett Harnett, one of the true greats of our sport, and and, and three, just uh, a desire just to, just to help and do racquetball and be a part of racquetball because it's been a, a great part of his life. Uh, Mike Coulter has been one of the longest running tournament directors in the history of our sport. I believe Mike has been doing events now for, for 33 years, coming, uh, coming up to this year's three wall ball event, which is going to be the focus of this conversation because of the unique difficulty of hosting the event. And uh, Mike, thanks for being with us tonight. How are you? I'm doing great, Marty. Thanks for all the, kind things to be said and um, talking about the event. And yeah, it goes back to the history of, like you said, uh, being friends with Brett, getting to know you and uh, you know, you're in your early twenties as well and getting to know a number of the other pros. And um, this is something I've been able to give back a little bit to the sport, you know, uh, um, by putting on some events that have become really fun here in Vegas. Um, started out, like you said, doing some small shootouts and some graveyard tournaments back in the late eighties and then in the nineties started doing some of the IRT stuff with Hank Marcus and then into the 2000s. And then we started the outdoor stuff. And now we're up here going, this was year 11 on three wall ball and still going pretty strong. Uh, a few challenges this year, as you, as you said that uh, we have, but we made it through and we held a national event, uh, which I, I, I guess I'm pretty proud of the, of the team of people that helped make it happen. Um, because so far this year, we're really the only major event that's got to happen. Well, uh, a, a couple of reasons why this event happened, Mike, quite frankly. One, we were fortunate enough that this was an outdoor event that helped significantly because due to all the indoor courts and clubs and, and all the restrictions, it became an impossibility at this particular time to host an event as, as the U.S. Open went by the wayside. But also, too, Mike, without Mike Coulter running this event, I don't care and I don't want to, you know, I, you know I, I'm just merely telling the truth. There was only one person that could have pulled off of this event, as everybody will soon find out what happened during the, the kind of like life of this event. Uh, I want to touch base on one thing. Mike, what, what was the very first event that you that you were a tournament director of? Uh, it was probably a graveyard shootout at the Las Vegas Racquetball Club back in about 86 or 87. I worked graveyard there at the time. Uh, we I went to work at 10 o'clock at night, and we I'd work until 6 in the morning. We had eight courts at the time, and the courts would stay busy until 2 in the morning, take a break for about an hour and a half, and about 4 o'clock in the morning, the school teachers would come in. Uh, when I started doing the graveyard tournaments, I'd have 75 to 100 players come in and play racquetball from 10 o'clock at night till 4 in the morning. Wow. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. I mean, you were around – and you sort of saw the the heyday of the participant, uh, you know, of the sport and stuff. Because I, I remember very very early on in stuff and coming to events, and, and I and I think I actually I think I met you even before you started uh, uh, doing doing the tournament. Stuff. You're you're right. Yeah, yeah I started uh, going and doing some stuff. I played in '83. And, you know, in 84, and you know, like I said, I got to be a good amateur elite player, maybe a low open doubles partner when I had guys, but I enjoyed playing the game, working in the clubs. And, you know, I'd tag around with Brett, and we had a bunch of us guys that all pile in the car and go to the tournaments out west and go to the sports gallery in California, Phoenix down in Tempe, you know, and get to go to a handful of those events. So I got to meet you through Brett, 
you know, and, you know, obviously your friendship with Brett's mom and dad and, you know, going to the lake. And obviously there's a lot of other stories other than just racquetball that how we got to meet. But like I said, uh, and you said earlier that so many of the people I know in my life directly or indirectly because of racquetball. And um, so no matter how difficult it gets at times, it's just like a job, but I, I like to try to give back to something that's given me so much in life. And that's, that's kind of where I try to put on some of the best tournaments. And, and like you said, you, you give me a lot of credit, but I've been fortunate enough to have a great team of people going back, even after we did those little shootouts back in the nineties, when I did the um, pro nationals in Vegas, I had a, a lady by the name of Margo Daniels that helped us out. And everybody in racquetball knows that name. Uh, I had a partner of mine, Tony Riama, who passed away, uh, helping me do stuff. I had Fabian and Rich here in town. But I've been lucky to have a great team even going forward back into the, you know, the 90s and the 2000s with dealing with Hank and then Steve Lerner and then Vic Lebowski and, and you know, Peggy. So I've always been lucky enough to have some great teammates to help make this always happen. And, and, you know, you're talking about some of the best tournament director organizers in the country when you're talking about, you know, Vic Lebowski and, and a number of those names and stuff. Those are people that have run some of our biggest events, most successful events and stuff in outdoor and stuff. Absolutely. They're all they're all part of Team 3. Of all. We're all part of that big family. And, you know, at, at some point we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, the two other big tournaments this year for outdoors. But, you know, Vic, Vic just was speaking the other day. Uh, about his tournament coming up at Beach Bash, and, you know, and he, you know, when he he got sick and he had a little bit of a reoccurrence again with stuff, we definitely reached out and you know not to step on anybody's toes in Florida, but you know I wanted to offer assistance to Vic in any way we could to help him out while he was getting through his um, medical things he's going through right now. That anybody from here for three, Team Three Wall Ball could come down there and help out in Florida that needed to do the same way Vic came to Vegas, you know, and brought Marcos up from down there to help out for a couple years and. Like I said, Steve Lerner running the tournament, and luckily we've been able to change a couple of the people interacting years based on what their family lives were too. But we've we've been lucky to have a lot of people put in a lot of hours to make the event happen. No question, and and I know I saw Vic's uh, broadcast and stuff, and it, the main uh, point of Vic's broadcast was to reach out to players as far as their commitment coming this year. And, uh, and this is kind of like a little sidebar, but if you are, if you are, if you have played in that event last year and you're intending on playing in it this year, please contact Vic. Uh, in Actually, hey, Marty, 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 he doesn't want everybody to contact him directly. He's got a team of people. And if okay. you, you go to the email address of war because of the situations okay. going through treatment and things, okay. he's got Ramon, Russell, Maddie, Tina, Marcos, and a handful of other people that you can reach out through the R2 site and through the War um, Florida group. And, and they're all on there as a group answering some of them, but he doesn't want to have people waiting on him just to reply because there, there's days that are a little bit more difficult for him than others and, and doing that. So that's the only thing that he does ask that reach out to the team and not just wait for Vic to reach back. Sorry to interrupt yeah. you. No, uh, thank you for that. But the, the main, the main reason for Vic's uh, uh, announcement was that he wants people to commit now so that he could allow people off the waiting list there's 30 to 50 people that are on the waiting list trying to get into the event and knowing vic he wants to try to give everybody the opportunity to play in the event and he'll stretch and, and everything about looking to include people because he wants everybody to have a great time and that certainly is one of the top three events uh in the game and stuff so please contact uh war or uh, Vic's group and stuff, and let them know that you will play or how many events there for, and then he could uh, he could work on that wait list. Getting oh, absolutely! As you said, that facility there is 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 second to none. I mean, I I actually I think you remember I, I stopped and said hi to you at the fence, and you were yep. shocked to see me. I actually um, for my buddy that I pick up cars for, he actually bought a truck down there down the street from where the tournament was. So I drove cross country. Came down, watched Rick play, got to say hi to a bunch of people I knew, said hello to you that day, watched some matches, had dinner, and then got back in the truck. I was back in Vegas on Sunday night. So it was a, wow. kind of a neat thing. But what a what a phenomenal facility they have there with the courts, you know, 50 feet away from the sand, then another 100 feet onto the sand, you're into the ocean, and the boardwalk, and just um, the neatness of that venue. It's, it's yeah. a historical place, and I know you've gone down there for a lot of years and played, but uh, – I look forward to going back this March and um, going there, and I'm hopefully going to 
drop a couple pounds between now and then. I'm going to try and play in one of the divisions, have a little bit of fun this year. That would be great. That'd be awesome. Let's let's do a little bit of a little a history uh, uh, about the event this year. And let me just say this. Uh, I, I think I talked to you more this past year than I've ever talked to you and stuff about an event or about racquetball or whatever. It seems like we were talking like at least twice a week starting six months back. And then when I said, when I thought about, well, you know, let's start about, you know, when I mentioned to you, you know, let's start six months ago about the chain of events that happened for you to pull this off. You were soon to correct me and tell me, and it's really is the truth that you start preparing for this event a week after the a last event is over. It's almost a year long process and stuff. Absolutely true. You know, as you, as you say that, I mean, as I'm on the forklift, the days we're tearing it apart the same way. Hey, I'm looking at tearing the stuff apart on Thursday afternoon as we're, we're still playing till Sunday, but looking at what goes into preparation for that. And actually, you know, even talking to some people at the tournament about what needs to go on to, to, to make the event better for the players and, and to enjoy that, you know, and I'll usually catch a couple days, but usually two, three days after we tear everything down, empty the parking lot and put stuff away um, until next year's tournament, which is usually by Wednesday afternoon, uh, Thursday at the very latest, but we, we have the, the lot completely cleaned off then. You know, I'll catch a little bit of a breath and maybe sometime last year I went on vacation this year, did it because of some of the restrictions and doing stuff, so I just stayed here and did it, but by Monday after the tournament, I was already – talking to people and trying to work out some um, date possibilities for this year coming up. We're looking at, um, we've had a couple of other people reached out from us at different venues. Um, it's nice. We've had a nice home and a great working relationship with the Strat for 11 years, but you know, all sponsorships change over the years. You got to have some things that are interchangeable. You know, you can go back to NASCAR. NASCAR had a, one of the longest running sponsors ever with Winston cup. And, you know, and then the last 20 years, they've had three or four major sponsors doing it. So, um, hopefully we'll stay at the Strat for this next year, but we've also had a couple other hotels reach out. That'd be kind of neat to be doing stuff. So we're doing that. We had a couple of new sponsors jump in this year and, and help out with, um, the opportunity to try to help make the event better, which is always nice. We had a couple of longtime supporters of racquetball come out of the woodwork and, um, reach out and want to help a little bit more this year, you know, and, and doing stuff. And that's one of the things that puts the wind back in my sails, as opposed to the things that went on this year to take a little bit of the wind out of my sails. Um, as you said, you know, yeah. we start working on this the week after the, the tournament's over and slowly spend a few hours a week doing that. And then, you know, as much time as I spend talking to you, um, Soda Man gets an earful of it on a regular basis as well. Every time we're driving to California or going to do something to, to another event, you know, we're bouncing ideas and saying, hey, well, what can we do to add to the tournament to make it better what should we change and doing stuff and, you know, always trying to figure it out just like in, in most sports, you know, money is a big driving force and, and um, you know, sponsors are needed to help make it happen. Prize money for the players, even though with these tough times that a lot of other organizations want to keep crying poor mouth about, we were lucky enough to raise just short of $35,000 between racquetball, handball and paddleball. We gave away 23,000 in racquetball alone because that's what our main sport is that we do stuff. But we also love having the handball people and paddleball people being here. So, you know, working throughout the year, trying to get those sponsors on board and doing stuff, it, uh, it's definitely a great challenge. And, and like I said, I'm lucky that I have a good team of builders. Um, you know, most of those are interchangeable, but we've always usually got about six to eight of the same guys that have helped out since year one. And then we had a couple of new guys every now and then because somebody has got a family deal or, it happens to fall in hunting season. Um, if you're into hunting, you know, I went with those guys think they don't care whether it's heck or high water. Uh, they don't care if there's a job to be doing or not. They're, they're putting their job on hold and they're going hunting for the weekend to get their sure. deer. And uh, they do that. So, um, but luckily I had my brother-in-law step in this year. Who's a, a union glazer. That's kind of semi-retired now and his construction background and, you know, some other people that are there were able to knock that out. And like I said, it takes about seven to 10 days to build the courts. It takes us about two and a half days to take them all down and put it away. But, um, you know, like you said, we'll spend hours each week talking about it, trying to talk to sponsors and doing stuff and give them as much exposure and, and give them back what, what they're, they're giving to the game. But, you know, the biggest problem that, you know, since you, back in the days when you were there, that's, that's when racquetball had true 
corporate sponsorships. And I don't know that racquetball has seen a corporate sponsor since the late 80s, maybe into the early 90s. I mean, I guess VCI was involved a little bit and Volkswagen um, Credit International and then Verizon did a short stint. But but for, for the fact of having national corporate sponsorship, it just doesn't seem to be there. And we're lucky that we all have some friends in racquetball that throw some money into it, but but all other sports that get to get to the top tier level have some national corporate sponsorship. And it's not like we look for them to solve all the problems of it, but to to lend their brand name to give some credibility to the events as well. You know, we've lucked out here. I've had some friends, even when we've had Coors Light or Bud Light involved, and you know, like I said, the Strat Hotel. I mean, I've got a corporate sponsorship with uh, the Ahern people that are part of the event. And it's a national thing. I guess it's the closest thing we have. But that truly is also because of a friendship that I've had with them for, for the last 20 years. In my big construction days, I worked for my friend uh, Derek at a company, and um, he allowed them to, to help us out with doing stuff. And, and um, he was a multi-million dollar corporation, and, and they did a lot of business with them, and they gave something back. And, you know, here they've been a great partner for us and, and a friend because they haven't been like most businesses. What have you done for me lately? I've been out of the full-time construction job for, for, you know, seven, eight years now. And, and they still help out a little bit every year and, and stick with us because we were a good partner back then and, and they appreciate it now. So um, I'll stop and let you let, have you a little bit of interjection right now. You got a question you're looking at me. like no, you might have uh, What I wanted to talk to you about as far as, is the event is I guess I'll go back like six months prior to the event in which we talked about the event and, and talked about the likelihood of the event even happening. This is back like probably close to near when the first lockdown and everything came from the virus and then moving forward. And I remember you going from being 90% sure that the event is going to happen and everything is go to 50-50 and, and maybe not even 50-50. And it was like a roller coaster ride for you to, I mean, for you to, to plan to, to judge how you were going to do the event. And also too, I don't think you had any idea about how, what kind of participation, because back then we didn't know if, everybody, if people were afraid to, you know, come out of their house or go play because a racquetball wasn't allowed in indoor or anything and stuff like that. So there were so many unknowns for you. And I remember talking to you about them and I would really, I, I really would, would have loved if we would have wrote down what we thought projections were, you know, in May versus when the event was next to 30 days, you know, 30 30 days out and there was close to 500 people that was entering the event. You know, we never thought. Yeah. Well, yeah. we definitely can definitely go back there to, you know, February and March, you know, it was, I was just finalizing the, the contract with the hotel for this year. And we were, you know, we, we do that every year. We pick the dates out and we've had a working relationship for 11 years. And even though there's been some management changes, we've been pretty good, been able to work through it without having the signed documents. So uh, we kept negotiating some things going on and then, the, the week before, we had just basically came to 100% agreement on what we were going to do for the tournament this year. You know, and every year it's give and take based on the year prior to what they'll, you know, give support wise and, and doing that. And then all of a sudden we said, yeah, I think it was on a, like a, a Monday, Tuesday. We agreed when I talked to the hotel manager, vice president, he goes, yeah, I'll get back to you in a couple of days. And then all of a sudden, I think that the pandemic really hit on on a Tuesday going into a Wednesday and then all of a sudden Wednesday into Thursday, every one of our hotels were told to shut the doors and everything wow. basically kind of stopped across the country. And, you know, when that was said, I mean, I honestly thought, okay, yeah, this is something completely out of, out of control um, that, you know, never seen in my lifetime, but I'm going, okay, we shut things down for, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks, mm -hmm. you know I mean? I guess it's something you think about in a third world country, but I never anticipated it dragging on like it did. You know, I thought, okay, we'll get into March, you know, okay, into April, but for sure by the end of April, we're going to um, start seeing some changes and things happening. Well, you know, as you said, we talked and, you know, every time you'd call and I try to keep that positive look in my, 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 my statement to you going, well, I can't see why things aren't going to change. We're going to find a way through this like we do with everything else. And, 
you know, I mean, um, had some other challenging times when doing some stuff racquetball wise and, and, and seeing that happen. But then, you know, April comes around, you know, doing things on a, every two weeks and reaching back to the hotel and saying, okay, where are we at? Uh, we we're about to sign the contract and none of the people are working. Everybody's been put out on a furlough and nobody can respond to anything because then I guess it constitutes their back to being employed and you'd be paid a full salary. So nobody's responding to anything, you know, from the hotel wise. And so basically we got into May, you know, and even though we had the contract, just had to cross the T and dot the last I and here's your copy. Here's my copy. And, um, didn't know. So we just slow played everything. We didn't shut anything down. But um, one of the things we did do with R2 is we just left our site active with all the information on there and put you know that, hey, there's going to be some changes this year. going to have to do the COVID restrictions. Uh, the one thing that we never did do is turn on collect money from anybody. Exactly. Uh, you know, we allowed people to sign up and, you know, tell them that, you know, the COVID is going to be there. But, hey, our suggestion is don't buy a non-refundable plane ticket or a date change just in case because obviously no matter how many good thoughts we have in this that the government and in our health departments can make a change at the last minute and throw a curveball at us and um as we get further along this story you're going to find out how much of a curveball they sent but uh so we thought things would happen the hotel you know, came back online in, in June and they said, OK, let's work through that. And then we started looking at the dates. And, you know, we had the actual second and third week of September available that we were doing the dates on. And then, um, you know, the U.S. Open started um, not being sure they were going to have it. So we kept watching that. And when when um, they were able to make the announcement, they canceled their event. We chose to move the tournament back another month for our own safety of trying to give it more time with COVID. To, to make sure we had it, not with any real indicators um, that we needed to at that point, because things were a little bit more lenient during the summertime and things were going the right direction in June and July. But then all of a sudden, the 1st of August, about the week, the time that Doug announced that they were going to move the date, you know, change the dates to 21, um, our governor came back out and tightened the, the rope on everybody here with the COVID stuff again and said, hey, uh, you know, when we, just like everybody else, it was only essential businesses that were allowed to be open. Uh, construction was allowed to continue on Raider Stadium and the convention center. Everybody else needed to stay home. Most stores were closed. Unless you need to go to Costco or a Home Depot, you weren't supposed to be going nowhere. And, you know, we're trying to plan an event that people have to buy plane tickets, request vacation time. Same thing every other major event goes through. And we're going, okay, like you said, you know, we went through times where I thought we were at 90, 95%, you know, once we came back online and the hotel started opening back up and seeing things were to come back to being open, not basically back to normal, you know, we're still, we're still kicking around the idea. Shows are just now starting to come back. But the problem is even with all the, the shows coming back with the social distancing, the hotels are losing their butts. I mean, you, you can't fill up a hotel all the way. You can't fill up stuff you know and then then you know as i said we'll get into all the restrictions and guidelines but you know everybody's struggling for money to 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 get things done we're out there trying to solicit a couple of sponsors and luckily uh we've had some longtime sponsors that have been around and, and done stuff and you know they stuck with us this year you know we had one or two smaller sponsors that said you know we're just really struggling bad this year we're not going to be able to. and i said hey we completely understand we appreciate all the years you've been with us um, I'm lucky that I have probably a half a dozen to, to, to a dozen sponsors that have been with me since the, the mid nineties that, that help out in a small way uh, of doing stuff constantly. So we were able to do that, you know, and obviously still spending a little bit of effort and time and money in the, into July. Um, but then all of a sudden the, the first week of August came and, and that's when they shut some things down again and tighten the grip. So I was back to 50, 50 on it, even though we moved the date back another month, you know, now we're into September and, you know, like you said, you know, we talk a couple of times a week and, you know, sometimes we just shoot the nonsense about what's going on, whether it's sports or something else. And then, then the question, well, Hey Mike, what do you, what do you think the chances are the tournament's actually going to get to happen? I mean, I know you're outdoor and I mean, the constant answer always was, Hey, we got to have less rules than anybody does indoors. And I mean, obviously indoors are still having problems today. Being outdoors, I never, ever would have thought there was going to be this many problems with outdoor events going on. I mean, because of, of doing that there. But, I mean, our governor even made it difficult for people to go and play golf at some point, you know. So, 
we ended up moving into September and, and things seemed to be loosened up and they kept making a directive every couple, um, well, at least once a week, maybe sometimes every other week. And, you know, we went from, okay, gatherings are allowed to happen. You know, you can have 50 people. And then actually the, the week prior to me moving equipment and putting it out on the property, um, they moved the directive to 250 people um, per, per location. And which most people didn't realize that the Strat owns that property um, where the parking lot is, but they used to have their office buildings on there too. So there was actually technically two locations on that one parking lot. So that allowed us to have, uh, and what I could say is this weekend, they finally had the first convention really back in town. It's the, the um, Mike in, um, it's the, the car show, the, the car auction, you know, the, one of those really expensive car auctions they have yeah. at the convention center. And they've oh, wow. got their first, the first auction going on to where they're only allowing 250 people per room, but they're using four rooms to, to do the convention there um, and to have the car sales. So we, we felt pretty good at having 500 people, but then they also said that um, you could only have 500 people and it was a non spectator event. So that was another crash to us of going, you gotta be kidding me at spectators. Then they throw out um, because of the OSHA regulations, they were coming back and, finding people because of referrals. And what I mean by referrals were that people were taking pictures on social media and posting them, which I think, you know, most people have heard about, you know, when people going over to Hawaii, you know, you go to Hawaii and you don't think you're going to go over there and spend, you know, two weeks quarantine in a hotel room. You go out on the beach and you snap a picture of yourself and they're showing that. And the next thing you know, the, the internet police are watching and um, they get a fine sent to them for doing that. And that was one of the restrictions we had here. So, out of all the years of ever doing this tournament, we've only had to go to the city to get a permit, a special permit. And unfortunately, even though it's racquetball, we're held to a standard of every other sporting event in Las Vegas, whether it's a UFC fight, uh, the boxing that you know used to be world championship events, uh, to the national rodeo, to anything to do with sports, we're, we're held to the same standards. And I, it's hard to understand, but I guess at the same time I do. You know, I understand, you know, they, they got to watch out to make sure that with the health department, people, food vendors are doing things because most people just look at somebody got sick or something bad happened. They just blame it on Vegas and not on the one individual place. So that made it tough. So we ended up having to go not only to deal with the city, then it became the county, then it became the state, then it became the health department. And the last curveball that was thrown into it was the Nevada Gaming Control Board. So all five of these entities had to sign off on different things. They would get different directives, so they weren't really prepared to deal with it. So the bottom line was we were told the week prior to me moving on property that we had been okay with getting a permit, dealing through the city that we were doing stuff with. We moved our equipment on the property on a Thursday, Friday, started building, doing stuff throughout the whole weekend. Going on a Tuesday, I get a message from Peggy. She goes, all right, what are you doing? I go, I'm just sitting in the truck doing some paperwork while the guys are building. We just finished having lunch. She goes, she, I go, you got some news? She goes, yeah. And I go, is it good news or bad news? And she just goes, it's horrible news. And she starts to cry. And I said, I'm thinking right away, nothing to do with the tournament. I'm thinking that, you know, as we're all getting older, we've got friends that something happens to or somebody, you know, had an accident or something like that. She goes, no, we, we had gotten our permission from the city and once again, about 11 o'clock, they were sending the, the hard permit over. And, and at 12 noon, she got another directive from the state saying that the city had no authority to issue your permit, even though they've been telling you that. There was a new directive given by the governor that now made, even though your group could go to 250, that actual amateur tournaments weren't allowed to start until the 24th of the month. No exceptions. Your event needs to be shut down. Well, we're two thirds of the way into building the event. Um, should I stop so for a second? You, guys, you want to interject? Mike, let me let me just say this, Mike. Out of working for almost a year, okay, the ups and downs. You know, it, it, how how many how much how many days and how many hours does it take when you pull the first forklift on to build those courts? Uh, we're anywhere from eight to, to 10 days by the time we're done doing it. You know, and that's usually an eight to 10 hour day based on weather and whether we have 12 guys out there working or 15 uh, doing it. You know, and we'll, the guys are good. They'll give up their weekends to do stuff. 
So like I said, we were five days into the build already. You know, so you're they go up fast to start, then they slow down a little bit in the middle, and then you start tweaking everything at the end. So we were at a, a substantial amount of money, probably in the range of thirty plus thousand dollars already into setting the event up. And the fact that we still had not turned on the collect entry fee money from anybody. We were doing that on our own dime out of pocket. And and you know, even most of the sponsors, we didn't ask them for anything until we were sure. But uh, we put that on hold until that point. And then um, that next week, we actually finally turned that on when we, we got to doing some things. But um, but um, I, what I want to touch touch on, Mike, is after a year of planning and really the last six months of hardcore roller coaster, you know, up and down, event happening, not happening, all this virus, everything that's going on with Vegas. And now you are halfway into building these courts. You've, you've, you, you took a stance early on, what I thought was an incredible stance, by not taking one dime from anybody until you were 100% sure, which really you couldn't have been until the first ball was hit, you know, on Thursday. And then you get the news that the event is canceled. Okay. You got the, well, you yeah. got the permit. Okay. The permit is canceled, right? Correct. And That's without the permit, without the permit, we can't host the event on hotel property because they'd be in violation of their gaming control license and everything else. So the tough part, we had to go back to the drawing board and refigure our paperwork. But the key word was they said amateur event. Well, this was a professional event. We had the men's and women's pro tour involved in it. So we brought them into it. We also had some handball prize money and doing things. Well, we had just had a pickleball event the weekend prior to that. And the same weekend as I was building, we had a national golf tournament here. So we went back to the drawing board and said, okay, we got to resubmit. They did the same thing. Kept shuffling the papers around again for Peggy and telling her to resubmit this. Um, we're going to be okay. They're going to give us the permit back. And it's okay. All day Friday, we got to keep building. So now I'm keep building. My guys ask me each morning we come in, are we keep building now or are we starting to tear down already? I go, well, we're not tearing down until the event's over, but there is a possibility that could change. So Peggy kept working really hard at doing stuff. Then we uh, reached out to another one of our friends, Dave, here in town. He was um, kind enough to reach out and um, help with some people that we knew. And then um, he reached out to a retired um, mayor of the city. He happened to be sitting across the table from his wife on Friday night at 6 p.m. Um, having dinner and said, hey, um, give us a call on Monday morning and we'll talk to you about what's going on. Well, uh, in the meanwhile, like I said, the, the tough part was at three o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, I started to hit panic mode again because I know that we're going into a weekend. We don't have the permit. The hotel is on me about, hey, they've got a thousand room nights booked for customers that they're going to have to dump that because they need to sell those rooms to somebody else to come in. So we started getting that pressure. Um, luckily, the phone call took place on Monday morning uh, with our friend Dave and, and um, Carolyn Goodman and Peggy. Um, they went through the whole story of it. The mayor said, absolutely not. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure this is going to happen for you. Uh, we believe in what you're doing. I guess they checked on a couple of things. By 4 o'clock on Monday afternoon, I was told that we had the permit back and to keep going. I mean, I, I guess I took the biggest gamble of my life living in Las Vegas by thinking that was going to happen. And we didn't actually get the permit copy back until Tuesday afternoon. And that's when I finally had the hard copy in my hand that I knew that the event was going to be able to take place. But my biggest disappointment on Friday night is when it really scared me knowing that I got people starting to come in on Sunday and Monday already for the tournament. And the fact we might have to cancel the event. Um, other events have gotten canceled while people were en route to them because of, of changes that were made. But um, like I said, I believe that we did everything right. and We followed all the rules and guidelines that they asked of us. So I believe that we did everything right. And I followed through on it. I took a gamble. Um, but as I said, you know, we didn't collect anybody's money. And I, as I admitted on another show about a week ago, there was a reason I didn't turn the money on. Because if anybody was going to lose money, it was going to be me and my time and some of the staff that we did things. And, you know, we told people they'd always be able to cancel their hotel rooms. Um, you know, it might have been an inconvenience to some vacation time they took, but we didn't want anybody spending any of their money until we know we could do the event. And, and luckily enough, it worked out um, and we got to hold this event. 
wasn't quite up to par of what I hoped for every year, but we got through it. Uh, there's a couple of COVID rules and the mask wearing and, and some things that took a little fun out of it. But I think for the most part, everybody enjoyed getting to see their friends. And for the first time in a year's time, they, they got to be with people that they know and see usually two or three times a year and doing an event. Absolutely. I mean, the, it, it really, you know, the, the event, as far as I'm concerned, was an, an incredible success uh, for two parts. One, that, you know, the hell that you went through and especially the hell you went through the last week with the hotel threatening to yank the rooms and losing the permit and knowing that people are going to start flying in tomorrow on Saturday. I mean, that had to be an aggravation level of of monumental proportion. And I just have to say that unless it was a Mike Coulter with 33 years of experience of running an event and then to to be a diehard for the sport of racquetball, there is no question that there's just nobody else that could have pulled off this event, Mike. There really isn't. And, oh. and not only not only pull it off, but then put themselves at such personal financial risk of everything. I mean, you know, that, that, that would be a, a, a real big bullet to, to, to bite, Mike. It really it wasn't the smartest thing that I, I probably would say that I've done the last 33 years. But, yeah, I'll definitely agree with you on the fact that in 33 years, this was by far the hardest event that I've ever had to do. And, you know, the easy thing would have been to pull the plug and, and not do it. But as I kind of bragged a couple of weeks before the event, because things were going right, that every time they moved the wall in front of us, we'd find a way to get around it or go over the top and do what was asked of us. And in no way was I being arrogant that, that you know, we thought we were just beating the system. We were doing everything that was asked of us and continued. And every time that we did what was asked of us, they kind of changed the rules. And that was the probably most disappointing part. But Peggy was just unbelievably awesome uh, doing it. You know, Rick behind the scenes helping out. Uh, Dave stepping up and reaching out to some of the people, like I said, that, you know, talk to to retired mayors, current mayors, mayors in the, the cities next to us, a retired senator. Um, you know, some of the power of people in Las Vegas. You know, back in the, the 80s, it would have only taken one phone call and I could have reached out to somebody that I knew. And um, the, the, the rules would have got bent and changed for us and made sure that it wasn't quite quite as difficult. But we did everything and, and crossed every T and dotted every I. And like I said, I, I think was we did the right thing and it, it worked out right because um, everybody got to play and have some fun and, uh, and, and just, like I said, it, we, we lucked out on perfect weather. I mean, the weather was great. You know, I mean, I Sunday made that joke. And I mean, I couldn't have asked for better weather, you know, mid mid to upper 80s during the daytime, you know, 70s in the early evenings, um, you know, playing until midnight. I mean, I always look at it as referring to it as a tailgate party and people playing underneath the lights, uh, watching Monday night football, uh, sure. people getting to play under the lights. Then, then as you talk about, um, you know, the setup of the event, but then to have all the great players that we had come into the event this year. Yeah. Um, obviously, the big story around the event this year was that that Kane and Ben came and played, um, played De La Rosa and Alvaro in the final. On the women's side, we had Paola playing with, you know, Janelle, uh, a mom that's seven months pregnant. And, you know, they turn around and win the women's doubles. Uh, you had Michelle, who just had a baby five months prior to that, playing along with Carla doing stuff. Then you had the De La Rosas winning the mixed doubles part of it. You had uh, Soda Man and Alvaro beating Rocky and Jesus, Jesus from Southern Cal and the CPRT. Um, you know, the legends of the game that came and hung out. You know, I know we were going to touch base on that. Sure. First, wait until you ask me that question, but uh, I'll throw it out there. I mean, look at the poster that uh, Mike Augustine, um, let alone Mike Augustine, Belinda, Robbie, um, Steven, and, and um, uh, Jeannie, that were the photographers taking all the great pictures and videos around there. But the fact that we had, you know, yourself, Marty Hogan, Charlie Brumfield was here, Brett Harnett was here, uh, Benny Colton was out here doing stuff, you know. Uh, one of the things that, you know, we missed at the tournament that I would have loved to have done um, last year, um, you know, Greg came out here and got to be at the event and spent a little bit of time with him. So I was fortunate to, to spend time with Greg and he was going to come back out and play this year. And uh, 
unfortunately with the, the bad timing of his passing and you know getting elected into the the hall of fame we were going to make sure we made a big thing of that for him and, and acknowledge mm -hmm. that and we didn't really get to do that and i know dave was looking at coming out too but it was tough for him uh this year but hopefully you know um he'll get that acknowledgement he's in there in the hall where he belongs and you know i know you did some stories and did a couple of shows on that with dave as well but sure. um you know those those great players being here each and every year and in previous years you know the fact that the jack huzaks and ruben gonzalez's and uh cliff swain's out here sudsy was here again this year i mean you know the list is long of how many players that have played for all the years that they've come in and interacted and had some fun here at this outdoor event that we're, we're really thrilled that we're able to do it. Yeah, and I think, you know, and I think that's kind of like uh, a slap on the back for you, the history that you had in the game with all of the pros that uh, that you have mentioned and stuff, going way back into, into, into my day and stuff, and how Brumfield and stuff, who even before, but then again participated in, in the outdoors back in 79 and stuff, some of the very first ones, but still has come to this event is really a tribute to your hard work and how three wall ball has just become that big and that popular and almost is like a, a yearly kind of uh, reunion amongst uh, many of the top, uh, top pros and stuff. Oh, uh, absolutely. Like, like you said, not to interrupt you, but yeah, you know, Charlie's been out here, I think for like five of the last six years, he, he looks at it as a little bit of a vacation, and he has some of his health issues he's dealing with as well. But he comes out, has a great time, tells stories, talks to fans, and he's out there on the court giving instruction to some of the younger players and talking about how great it was. You know, as I said, Dave was going to try to come out. Even Egan was going to come out. But with the restrictions from Hawaii, it was real tough for, for him to come out. And like you said, um, you know, the players from back in the 80s that I got to grow up, watching and going hanging out with Brett watching the tournament watching you play and do stuff and travel places to to going into the 90s with all the great players at some point that got to be there and then and, you know going up you know up to the current day sure sure uh let's touch it let's 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 move a little bit uh, a little bit out of the out of of the uh, out of the three wall ball and stuff and kind of discuss you know you you were involved in running pro events back in 87, 86, 87, starting all the way up to running, you know, the event, uh, the last event and stuff. So you've seen kind of like uh, a good generation and a half of professional racquetball players. What do you think or what is your kind of take on how were the racquetball pros you know, from 20 years ago versus the, the you know, in the early 80s or whatever, uh, all the way up through today. What do you think the, the, the differences are uh, in the men's, uh, in the men's uh, uh, circuits and, and, and the, pro player, the pro player himself? Um, I think it's definitely changed a little bit. You know, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, like I said, I can touch back on the mid, mid 80s really. Um, early years of the 80s on the players. And it seemed like it was a business of men playing the game. Um, you know, when when you got on the court or the Peck brothers got on the court or Halasher got on the court, you know, Brett going to an event, you know, you guys were dressed to the T. You guys made sure you had clothing that looked professional. The same way that I – maybe it's bad to compare it, but it was you guys dressed a lot like pro tennis did. You cared about your appearance. You had on really nice outfits. Clothing manufacturers were involved. And obviously, it was a lot easier when you had those manufacturers involved. You know, when you had Catalina Tour providing you clothes or Nike comes in and provides clothes. Now it's few and far in between. And I think that the sponsorship opportunities back then made it a little bit different, too. And, and nowadays, the sponsorships are so much tougher for the kids to get and financial support to do things. But I always looked at it in the 80s that it was a bunch of men playing the game um, of going out there. You know, the way Yellen carried himself in there, the way the Pecs did, you know, the way Brett wanted to carry himself in there. It was a real business. And then, you know, and then in, in, in doing that, and it was really enjoyable and getting to see that, you know, and, and Ray and Ruben at the end of that, and then Cliff came in at that time too. And then we kind of move into the 90s, and then I got lucky and got to see that next big wave of great players coming in and 
and, and Jason and John Ellis and Sudsy, Cliff, you had Mike Ray, you had Doyle. Um, you know, Ruben was still playing in there with them. And then, um, you know, that was going throughout the whole 90s when I did the stuff at the Sporting House and we did the Pro Nationals there with Hank and lucky enough to to have – the, the second largest tournament at the time then, too, next to the U.S. Open, the Pro Nationals, the years that Margo helped run it. You know, we had 700 players playing in that, you know, with full rounds of 32 and 64 players. It was really awesome. And, and back in those days, you know, we got a couple of years that we were lucky enough to have a handful of sponsors being a little bit bigger and got up to, you know, twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000 in prize money. But unfortunately, a lot of years um, here in Vegas, the sponsors were thin and there was times where, the guys were only playing for twelve to fifteen thousand dollars, and you know it was tough. But you know entry fees back in those times were you know forty dollars for your first event, twenty dollars for your second event. You know you got to pay for all this stuff in a club and provide food and doing stuff and and making it happen. So the pros, um, you know, getting back to that, the pro nationals were awesome. We had all those guys going into it, and then you know there was always back. And let me step back a little bit too. The the pros in the eighties there was like eight guys playing on tour, maybe 10 guys that they were winning events. Then we move into the nineties and there was, you know, six or seven guys that had won some events, but the majority of lion's share of events were going to two or three players. And then we move into the two thousands. And even though there's some great players out there, they're, they're great club players. And, you know, it's that big fish in a small pond or a small pond with a big fish um, of playing. So I've seen a lot change a lot. A lot of great, talented young players coming up now, but I don't know if they have the same um, depth to go through and fight against everybody. And, and it surely has hurt here in the United States with as many clubs that have disappeared over the years. And it's unfortunate for the kids in the United States playing that they don't have the same opportunities. Most of these clubs don't allow juniors in there to practice anymore. Heck, Mexico's doing a phenomenal job down there for their athletes and helping them to get to play. And, and then, you know, you roll into the, 2000 2010s and you know there's one guy that's dominating and i mean he's just dominated for 10 years and and there's only been a handful of other victories and, and those mostly come when he doesn't show up to the tournament so um I, I don't know if that's a very good explanation or what you were hoping to hear out of me um of what i've watched transpire over the years but um you know we definitely don't have near enough support for the united states players to play there's no corporate sponsorship um, these other countries do things to help their players play by giving them bonuses for winning tournaments and doing stuff. Our government doesn't do anything to to help racquetball. And unfortunately, we've got 50 other sports that pay 100 times more than racquetball does uh, um, to be doing stuff. So you've got to have a passion. Most of the kids, you know, in your day of growing up or even Brett's or even into the 90s, most of those players – their parents were taking them to the club and they picked it up because they were learning to play because their parents were at a club doing it. That doesn't happen now. Um, so I believe going right back to the little bit of the outdoors, a better chance for, for kids to still play some ball, but that's, I'll, I'll kind of stop there and hopefully gave you something of what my feeling was of the, the pro level of play from the eighties, to the nineties to the current day. Yeah. You know, the reason why I ask you is because I'm asked that question all the time, you know, What's the difference between the pros of today versus the pros of, you know, when, when, you know, during my era and, and, and I say that the diff, the main difference is, is when I went to a tournament, you know, there were 15 guys that were, they were fully intending on ripping my head off to trying to win. They were there to win, you know, going to, you know, even talking to, you know, your, your favorite player, which was Brett, you know, Brett packed clothes and made an airline ticket to go in on Wednesday or Thursday, and his return home was Sunday, Sunday night, which was after the finals. And if something happened, they didn't make it to the finals or whatever, you know, the changing or doing everything would be on him to where so many of the pretend pros, knowing that they weren't going to be able to make it through the round of eight, which means that's Friday night, they would have already been booked into another tournament that same weekend. We talked that happened. Them. Yeah, absolutely. That happened a lot of times. And I, I, we don't need to say any names of players in it, but you know, you'd see it sure. a lot in Southern California. Uh, the players, I mean, they're great players. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Very but good. they were qualifiers yes. in your pro draw, but they were, when they got with that specialized group of you guys, now the talent pool became so good 
that they just became an average club player. You know, hey, everybody can be good in their own little town, but then when you get the best of it, you know, you got 100,000 people playing a sport, you're going to have 10 really good players there. You got 1,000 people playing the sport, you're going to be lucky to have three or four good players. And once in a while, you find a, a, a diamond in the rough, right? That has to be a, a, a Kane's a good example of that coming from Canada. I mean, there's always been some great players, don't get me wrong, from Canada. But sure. to be able to bring his game up to that level, you know, I mean, let's be honest, how lucky – you were, and I mean, maybe that's the wrong way of putting it, but for the quality of play that you had back in St. Louis, you could go back as you were growing up and you had five, 10, 15 guys to go and play there. You know, Brett grew up here and he'd get a lot of his practice in when he went away to a tournament. Or, I mean, I can remember during the years that Brett would go down to Southern California to get some practice sessions in and doing stuff because he didn't have as many top players here. But as yeah, you said, back in that day, 15 guys were looking to win the tournament. Now I think there's one guy that's going to win the tournament and there's two or three other guys that have hopes of winning, but um, a lot of times they're playing for second place. I mean, and, and, and I don't mean to be putting any players down. The, the sure. proof is just the putting of the numbers. I mean, when Kane shows up and plays in a tournament in the last 10 years, how many times has he lost? And even though these other players are coming up to play, but Kane has won a number of tournaments and that's just a hardened fact. And, um, you know, he's missed a few tournaments and some of the other guys have had an opportunity to win. And that happens. And they're, they're phenomenal players on their own. But when, when Kane's still there, it, it definitely throws something different into the mix of, of the percentages yeah. going down to play for first and second. Yeah. And there's no question that, you know, him showing up this year for the first time with his partner, with Ben and playing, making it all the way to the finals. And I mean, I think he lost, they lost 11-8, you know, in the finals. I mean, when you lose 11-8 in the finals, I mean, you're you're splitting hairs as to who's who's the better team and whatever. Oh, even though it was phenomenal for the event, and and I hope the fact that Kane had as good a time as he said that he did, and I think that you know that he got to find that the atmosphere out there was was so much different than you know other places. I did hear some comments that he made on a different show that you know he was really surprised at how laid back and relaxed and how much fun he had, even though it's what he does is a job. It wasn't the same feeling as he has when he's indoor and he got to enjoy it a little bit. So I hope that that means, you know, whether we see him back in Vegas again, but I hope we see him playing outdoors somewhere else. I'd love to have him back here again, playing again. And, and we'll see if that gets to happen. But, you know, I think he was a, a, a true asset to the game uh, and sure. to the tournament and you know, being there along with all the other top pros that were there. You know, I mean, he was a new added face, but the other longtime pros that we've had in Rocky and, De La Rosa and Alvaro uh, on the men's side. And then on the women's side, you know, you go with Rhonda and Paola helping out and Janelle and, and, you know, a bunch of these girls that come out and play. So we created a stage to show the game and we've got to have the different participants come. So whether you're, you're the very best person out there or, or one of the people that are close to it, you still have to have a stage to show your wares on. I think everybody gave their best out there and, and, you know, um, some people finish a little bit better, but everything the people have a great time out there is, is the best part of it. And, you know, not that much. There's a little bit of disagreement, but not very much arguing um, over how things go. They, they they play pretty consistent and pretty fair. I mean, extremely, extremely. And, and, and touching base on, yeah, Kane came. It was great for him to come. Uh, you know, everybody was enthused about it. But when you take a look at the – pros who have come and been supporting the events like the Alvaro's, uh, Daniel, Rocky, you know, that have been coming and playing literally outdoor for years, for years supporting the game. You know, I've always, always thought that was a, a great thing and extremely, extremely kind of like unselfish thing that they would be doing to promote racquetball. Because outdoor racquetball, indoor racquetball doesn't matter to me. It's still racquetball and still promoting racquetball. I've always thought that was a tremendous and a great thing, and 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 you really couldn't you couldn't ask for three nicer, greater guys who would mix with any anybody in the out outdoor. And and the one thing that's great about uh, the outdoor game that I, that I've heard a big difference is how approachable all the pros are. They come and play outdoor. I mean people that come from all over to play, whether they're in age divisions or whatever, they all get a kick out of stopping, you know, if not watching full matches and whatever, always stopping and seeing 
the pros hitting, you know, hitting a few balls and, and whatever, because there's really truly, truly nothing like it and stuff. Uh, oh, in closing, I agree. Thank you, uh, Mike, I want I want you to mention the the difficulty, and I want you to mention the sponsors that were behind you, thick and thin, no matter what, during this most difficult time of putting on this event, and in raising sponsorship in racquetball is incredibly difficult in whatever, and 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 nearly impossible right now with with the virus because everybody's business is is kind of hurting, and therefore if if their businesses are tight, their promotional dollars are really are really tight. But you have been, you have had some of the most loyal sponsorship of people that have been behind you and stuff. I want you to mention some of those people because they are the, they're the they're the unsung kind of like hero and backbone of, of your event. Absolutely, you know. I mean, um, I'd like to obviously thank the Strat Hotel for hosting us for the eleventh year. We've had Ahern Reynolds involved with us. We've had Bella Vista Windows. Sodaman Vending, um, MZ Construction got involved with us this year. We've also got progressive cabinets that are involved with us. Uh, KWM Gutterman got involved with us this year uh, doing stuff. Um, you know, some other partners that are involved all the time are USA slash War, IRT, LPRT, CPRT, MRF. Um, you know, uh, Pro Kenix and Gearbox are the two companies that have been with this event since day one. Uh, of supporting it and doing things and you know i mean if you can please please help those guys out and purchase a product when you can um you know racquetball needs to support all of our sponsors um you know there's a handful of other new people that are on there if you go to the three wall ball site you can see every name and i apologize i probably forgot a couple of my wrote a couple notes to remind myself of a few of those people that are there that are big sponsors behind the scenes and then we've got some private donors that don't want their names mentioned you know, that they just want to give back to the game and help out. But uh, those are some big sponsors that have stayed with us over the years and um, making some stuff happen. So I appreciate you asking about that. And if everybody can go to the three wall ball site when they get a chance and check out some of the other names that I might not have mentioned, but they're truly part of the event as well. And, you know, everybody needs to try to help out when you can direct somebody there and, um, you know, send some work their way. And, you know, we've had the car dealerships that have been involved, compost, down in California helped us out this year and uh, that was nice of them. And, and, and like I said, there's a bunch of other people that have stepped up and helped. So I appreciate you asking about that. Sure. Um, you know, in closing, uh, if you could draw up like what you think the next three to five years of, of racquetball is going to look like, what would you, wow. <laughs> what, what's, what's in your, what do you see in your crystal ball? Well, I, mean, I hope that I got three to five more years of uh, doing three wall ball and, and doing stuff uh, and hope that somebody else will will help make it possible. You know, we invite the tours to come out and, and you know, even USRA slash war uh, who now owns war, their, their partner in doing stuff that even if they're not a sponsor of this event, they bring some potential sponsors to the game to to show what's actually available to happen and what a great time it can be. Um I think that outdoor has the best opportunity to grow larger at this point because kids can go to parks and play for free and doing stuff. Uh, the restrictions that we have in indoor clubs, you know, I mean, I, I talked to my friend Sarah in Hawaii today and they're still only allowing one person to go on a court and hit by themselves at this point. Um, you know, the, the tournaments coming up this next year, there's still some challenges in it. The first part of the year um, that going there, I, I think the tours, are going to continue, but they're going to get scaled back a little bit because they're going to have a hard time finding uh, financial support. And, and what the tours all need, and even um, the amateur um, governing body of racquetball, is they've got to get some corporate sponsorship that, that comes there and helps give um, a boost uh, of money to it and gives it some recognition. And, and maybe um, some of the people that are running these organizations um, maybe – um, need a little bit of help on the, the business side of it. I, I, I really can't speak for them because I don't have the answers. If I knew all the things, I mean, I know how to do things here in Las Vegas because I live in one area that I can reach back and talk to people. I mean, I, I hope the game continues on for a long time, but with every other sport that's out there constantly chomping at sponsor money in other places, there's no reason that racquetball players 
are brand loyal and clubs can definitely uh, financially live with players. If they run programs, they run some leagues, do some lessons and no more racquetball players will pay and be more consistent and not just keep their membership for the first three months of the year and then cancel it and go outdoors and do stuff. They'll do things indoors. So racquetball is going to have a tough way to go. I think this, this next year, because of what's gone on for the next seven months, I mean, not to get into the economic part of it, but, you know, I think we're still we're still cresting and we're going to see some financial problems coming up for the next six months to a year because of all the setbacks that we've had in the country. And that's, you know, is, is the first place people are going to put money into is racquetball to have a tournament. Um, you know, you got to have some friends once again to be doing that and, 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 and help out. So but if there's somebody out there that's got some corporate um, ideas and helping the sport out and plays it recreationally, um, please reach out to some of the leaders in the sport, different organization, whether it's men's side, women's, or the amateurs. Um, you know, there, there's people out there trying to do what they can do best for racquetball, but we've been struggling for some years now, and it's been going the wrong way. It's a great sport, clean sport for, for kids to play in, but if a kid's got a choice between putting a um, racquetball rack in their hand or a, a tennis racket or playing baseball or you know, doing some other sports that are there, they're going to, they're going to make more money doing that. And that's, um, you know, we need to get kids back off of playing with their tablets all the time and playing a sport that's good for their health and, and, and doing things uh, physically for them so they can be able to live a long, healthy life. I mean, look at a lot of these racquetball players you see playing in their seventies and eighties, you know, I mean, Marty, you're not a youngster and you're back to playing racquetball outdoors all the time as well. And, you know, sure. you look at a lot of these guys doing stuff and, People take a break sometimes in their midlife to raise their kids, but then they gravitate back to play racquetball again. Sure. I, I uh, Mike, uh, I'm a firm believer that the indoor game uh, in, in racquetball in, inside is, is at the professional levels, is done. Uh, until I'm proven wrong, uh, and I hope I am, I hope I am wrong, uh, you know, I just think the future of racquetball in the short term, you know, and I say over the next from now to the next three years or whatever, and the major growth and the major interest is going to be outdoor. I mean, I see it. It's a different attitude. It's a different kind of game. It's a different it's it's totally different than playing indoor. And and really, quite frankly, the whole emphasis of the of the state parks and, and everything is that you know, seven times more people are going to be visiting state parks over the next five years than prior. So I just think that outdoor racquetball has got a huge, tremendous opportunity. And I mean, in just in some discussions I've recently had with some people, I do honestly believe that there will be a formulation of an outdoor circuit. And I do believe that, you know, that there will be more and more and more participants that people have played indoor that want to play racquetball, that they will find that it is such an easy, easy conversion to go out outdoor. And it happens to be a lot more fun. And it happens to be actually, you know, a better, you know, I don't want to say a better workout, but just a different workout to where when you're out in the sun and, and the music's playing and you're playing racquetball, it's a kind of holy uh whole different environment of play and it's extremely favorable and, and quite frankly that's the reason why I, I i still love to to go out and play and go down to florida and play as many events as i i kind of like can and stuff and uh and support and basically support racquetball support racquetball at yeah. kind of like every level i definitely would agree with you there you know i mean the, the same thing with the dream of where i came up with doing the the court system here is there room for improvement? Absolutely. Somebody's going to come up with a better idea than what I had. I got the idea because I went down and watched Hank and, and some people when war first started up, do a little exhibition on an aircraft carrier. And I go, gosh, if you guys can build one court, we can probably build 10 or more. And I came back to Vegas and, and talked to my buddy David, who was one of the VPs at the hotel at the time and was supporting some stuff indoors when I was doing indoor tournaments. And I did indoor tournaments for 20, first 20 years of my career and only did indoor tournaments. And once I finally went outdoors, I mean, Scott Winters from Ectalon at the time back in the, the early 2000s kept trying to convince me to come outdoors. I, like, I don't want to go outdoors. And then I went back down to Newport Beach and Huntington Beach and hung out by the beach and, and did that stuff where I really enjoyed it. And um, I agree with you wholeheartedly that 
the future of, of racquetball right now, best opportunity is going to be the outdoor part because even something with these portable courts that I have, they can be put on the back of a pickup truck or a trailer truck and trailer or a semi truck and move to a parking lot at the beach, to a shopping mall, to a college university. They can even be put in indoors and, and playing three wall. If you put it into a convention center or did some of the other things and you don't have to have quite as much of an expense as a, a, a one glass court to put up in the opportunities, but still don't get me wrong. It's phenomenal watching the indoor stuff, but I just have, have fallen in love the last 10 years with the outdoor part of it in three wall and one wall for, like you said, that I think there's a great opportunity to, to tie the three events together and, and, and not to, to change it too much. But like you said, the next big possibility for a major outdoor event is going to be Vic's event down in Beach Bash in Hollywood, Florida um, in March. And then right after that, it's going to be in July in Huntington Beach again for uh, Jesus and Jeff doing the championships down there. They've been doing the event down there for probably the last seven or eight years as well. And they worked their butts off there on doing that. And you'll be able to check both our two sites to get more information there. But those are the next two big outdoor events coming up. And hopefully we'll get a, an opportunity to do some stuff for uh, three wall ball next fall and doing that and having a few more sponsors involved and uh, raising the bar up. And hopefully, hopefully by the first of the year, um, we're going to tie a, a little bit more together. And we have a couple of sponsors in the background that want to throw a little bit, as you say, a, a pro circuit, but we're actually going to tie the three big outdoor events between Florida, Huntington beach and Vegas and, and, and try to entice the pros to play a little bit more outdoor and, and raise sure. a little bit more prize money for them there and, and doing some stuff. But, uh, you know, one of the things is tough. We don't usually charge for seating and it's more of that park picnic area thing, but we've got to all generate more sponsor dollars to make it happen. And, and then we'll get more pros to play and enjoy it at the pro level, as you're saying, both on the men's and women's side. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in closing, Mike, I'd like to thank you. Thanks for coming on. I thought it was extremely important for people to know what, what you went through, you know, for you to, to be able to explain and, and, and for all of us in the racquetball community that came to your event, you know, racquetball players have always had kind of like a selfish attitude a, a lot of the times that, you know, that's kind of like, you know, you know, they just don't know exactly what it really takes to run an event. And for you to have put the effort in and, and have done what you had did, to make that event happen in Vegas was was truly monumental, and I felt like it really deserved kind of like its own time right now on uh, you know on uh, keep America great, uh, keep racquetball great, to let everybody know that you know we everybody in the racquetball community should be extremely grateful to not only the incredible effort that you have done in making this event happen, which in my opinion you're the only one that could have made it happen but also too for 33 years of, of a, de a dedicated individual in racquetball for racquetball. And, uh, and I want to thank you for that. And I also want to thank you for, you know, our friendship that we've had over such a long period of time. I appreciate you saying that Marty. And, you know, as you said, in closing, I'd like to be able to say thank you for asking me to do this a couple of weeks back when the tournament was going on saying after a little bit of time to do that, um, you know, obviously, who you are in the sport of racquetball has been great. Um, you know, having your friendship as well and coming out here and getting to hang out with some of my friends and, uh, you know, telling the stories, like I said, where you went back out on the courts at two o'clock in the morning and played ball with the guys. And after playing all day long and being out there in the summer and the winter when we had some courts there, uh, I'd like to thank JT as well for, for hosting this for us. It was great for him to put that together. And another person, this is big, you know, that does, constantly promoting stuff with keep racquetball great is norm mcnutt down in florida he's a racquetball uh junkie that loves the sport and gives so much time to it and constantly following up and created this page and look at they're just short of five thousand people in a little over a year that are following this page this is one of the the best pages out there to get any information on racquetball that you want throughout the whole year whether it's indoor stuff outdoor stuff the past history of the game Norm just loves it and, and, and gives a lot back to the sport as well. So there's so many other names that we can thank for being involved with it. Yeah. But again, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to ask me to do this, give a little explanation of Vegas and uh, 
look forward to a bunch more years of doing it. I don't know if it's going to be 33 more years, but uh, we'll get a handful more in there and look forward to this uh, fall. And I'll look forward to seeing you again, if not before being in Florida in March, hopefully maybe uh, during football season before the end for the Super Bowl again this year. And we'll revisit having a Super Bowl tournament party like we've done the past years. That would be great. That'd be awesome, Mike. Thank you. And once again, thank you to JT for doing all the technical stuff behind the, uh, the scenes. Thanks, super thanks to Norm McNutt, the uh, Keep Racquetball page and stuff on Facebook, which is kind of like the official voice and the official message for racquetball. Uh, I always tell anybody and everybody that, that, you know, bangs on my Facebook page about racquetball information or whatever, whatever you need, go to Keep Racquetball. Great. If Norm doesn't know the answer, he will direct you to the answers and to the information. It's the best side. It's constantly growing. And uh, and once again, thanks for all the great support from all of our great racquetball players. And uh, we look to do some more interviews with uh, Keep Racquetball Great. Absolutely. The best site. Everybody take care. Good luck and be safe.